and we can pray for those for you later. Uh, I make this announcement every Sunday, so here it is again. Uh, we do have in your pew rack in front of you a Connect card. Best way to keep up with what's going on at St. James is to get our weekly church email newsletter. Comes out on Tuesday, sometimes also on Thursday. I think this week it was only Tuesday. Uh, but it's the simplest way to keep up with what's going on. If you put your name and your email address or email's not your thing, you put your mobile phone number, then you'll get a, a link via text to the email newsletter. So if you put that in off and plate later on, then we'll add you to the mailing list. It's easy to unsubscribe if you decide it's not working for you. So that's a good way to stay connected. We wish you, you would do that for us today. So it's time for our prelude. Let's take this time during the prelude to focus and center ourselves for worship.
Let's stand as Larry leads us in our call to worship. He'll read the white text and we'll all read the yellow text together. Welcome to the space where the ordinary is sanctified, where the unexpected is to be expected, where diversity is celebrated, and life is reverent. Come to the space where the has no place, where pain is not in the Lord, and the potential is recognized, where everybody is somebody, and Jesus is the Lord. Come into this place where God calls us and sends us out. We're laughing and running. Not hushed and still, but celebrated and delighted. Come, worship God. Let's remain standing for our hymn. It's a time to uh, to continue to enter into God's presence for worship. And this is today a unison prayer of confession. So let's read this together. Gracious, loving, and merciful God, we confess that often we buy into who others tell us we are rather than remembering that we are your children, wonderfully and fearfully made. We let ourselves forget that we are included in your family through Jesus Christ and decide that we are alienated and alone. Remind us that we are always called to sit around your welcome table and help us to extend that welcome to everyone we meet. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Friends, you are invited to come to the fountain of life. And as we remember the vows made, the promises made at our baptism, we remember that we are also invited to the welcome table. You're invited to make yourself at home this morning. Jesus has included you too. God's claim on you can never be broken. Thanks be to God. Amen. So this is the part of the service. Go ahead and go to that next slide where we do what we call passing the peace. It, it's, it's a greeting time, but what would I say to people? There's your script. Peace of Christ be with you. And if you forget, you can look up there. It's right there. 
Uh, but what we do is we stand and we greet one another. Today we're going to do we're going to get a peace sign. Peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Now, you know how this works. After a few moments to let you bless each other with God's peace, there will be a couple of questions up here. So find two or three people to talk to and we'll discuss those questions. So let's stand up and let's pass God's peace among us. Well, we're going to talk with Doug and Suzanne. I never wear shoes. summer and so we've taken the communion song come to the table of grace and made new words for it come to the water of God so we'll use this each of the next this week and the four weeks after as our gathering song let's sing together it's easy to pick up about the song played in the 
It's by Tracy K. Smith, who is a brilliant poet. And remember, even though these words are written for grown-ups, I think there's a part in here that kids' hearts will especially understand. So if you're having problems being so loud, I'll read it for everyone. One of the women greeted me. I love you, she said. She didn't know me, but I believed her. And a terrible new ache rolled over in my chest, like in a room where the drapes have been swept back. I love you. I love you, as she continued. Down the hall, past the other strangers, each feeling pierced suddenly by pillars of heavy light. I love you throughout the performance, in every hand clap, every stomp. I love you in the rusted iron chains someone was made to drag until love let them be unclasped and left empty in the center of the ring. I love you in the water where they pretend to wait, singing that old, bloody song that dragged us to those things and cast us in. I love you, the angles of it scraping at each throat, shouldering past the swirling dust motes and those beams of light that wherever we now know, we could let ourselves feel. I knew to climb. Oh woods, oh dogs, oh tree, oh gun, oh girl, run! Oh miraculous many gone, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. Is this love the trouble you promised? That's the poem. But we didn't hear a lot of words about trouble. We heard the word love. I love you. Was the phrase I hear most in this poem. But how does love and trouble go together? Children, that's great. <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah, come on. Yes. Yeah. And this one's mine, so I know it's true. But maybe when God is making something trouble or good trouble, God is showing us how much God loves us to get us Sometimes God might be even causing trouble through us to show others that love, just like that song says. So let's do a troubled water prayer. You can make your hands as troubled as you want, and grown up can too. But when we're praying, let's try and feel that troubled love that God shows us too. Are you ready? God, we know that you are loved. We know that we are loved by you and by others. But God, when there are other waters, help us understand that you calm them, that you love us through them, and God, sometimes let us struggle those waters too to make space for loving others. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now, for our scripture today, Larry's going to read a scripture that you say, oh, I've heard this one. I know this one. Listen carefully to the exact words of the scripture and think about what they're saying. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, our study, this next five weeks is called Come to the Water. Now, let me show you something here. Uh, this is right outside here, the door. Uh, the door into the Tatum room. And if you haven't heard this story, let me tell you real quick. Our bishop... We got a new well. We got a new bishop in the Desert Southwest Conference. 
United Methodist Church. This is his, this was his second annual conference with us. So last spring, he came down to the, this is the South District. He came down to our area, and when he was here over a weekend, he went and met the pastor and walked around the church buildings of every church in the South District. So he was, he came to St. James, and I was here, and I think Alan, Jeanette were here, and uh, we were showing him around, I said, now, this is the Tatum room, and I said, now, it's named that because when Channing Tatum was a student at the U of A, he went to church here, and he gave the money for that room, and the bishop said, oh, oh, I said, no, that's not true, it's just a joke, but he was falling, everybody falls for that, but anyway, Right outside the Taylor room door is this. Now, what do you notice about that picture? You notice anything? Yeah. That light, I've straightened that probably a hundred times. And I, and I tell you what, and I tell you what, I would never do it on my own. But anytime Mindy's driving, driving, driving me by here, she's dropping me off. She says, "Fix that light when you go in." Because it drives her crazy. Okay? Me, I just say, oh, well, it's going to go back that way in 15 minutes anyway, or the next time the wind blows or whatever. But that light is right out there, and it's like that right now. I'm sure. Uh, would that bother you if you walked up and looked at it? Would you try to fix it? Uh, it seems we all have a desire or a drive with some of us to make things orderly. We resist chaos. We, most of us, we do not like it. And it's not only true with our physical space, it's often true with our life experiences. We attempt to find, to find or to make meaning out of the things that happen to us. Where does this, you know, we think, why did this happen? Where does it fit into my view of life? How does this change how I think about things? Does this threaten my view of life or strengthen it? Why do we spend so much mental energy on that? We'll come back to that in a minute. But first, let's look at our text for today for a moment. This was the scripture that Larry read. Very familiar scripture. Uh, you know, you know the, uh, the old joke, where is baseball mentioned in the Bible? In the big inning. You know, uh, so, oh yeah, the, the big owl. Okay. I first heard that joke in 1972. Okay, so anyway, uh, that's, that's a great granddad joke. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Literally, though, looking at the Hebrew text, in the beginning when God was creating the heavens and the earth. And notice what it says. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God. Some translations translate that the wind of God. It's the Hebrew word Ruach, which means breath, spirit, wind. Spirit's good is a good translation here. Where the and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In the original Hebrew grammar, the creation is a process of ordering and separation that begins with pre-existing chaotic matter. Creation begins when God brings order to this waterly, watery, primordial chaos. By, and he, God calls light into existence. It seems to picture a chaotic storm churning over the, over the dark and mysterious abyss of infinite formless waters. Boy, that's, that's, a, that's a phrase. Out of this, God summons order, thus creating the universe. Time begins with that creation. Nothing is said of the origin of the chaos or of God's activity prior to creation. God's creation in the beginning is unique and inexplicable and appropriately, the word there, God, 
created the heavens and the earth, that word is only used of the work of God in the Old Testament. It doesn't say anybody else ever did anything like that. Just God. Now, just a side note real quick. What If this is the interpretation of Genesis 1, 1 and 2, what does that say about ex nihilo creation? Say, Richard, I don't know what it says about it because I don't know what ex nihilo means. Okay, ex nihilo means, it's a Latin phrase, it's a technical term used in theology, it means out of nothing. Okay, uh, that God created out of nothing. Now here's the deal. Genesis 1, 1 and 2 doesn't prescribe ex nihilo creation. It doesn't exclude it, but it kind of starts in the middle of the story. In the beginning, when God was creating, the earth was formless and void, and God brought forth life. God brought order to it. God brought separation of the water. God worked in that. Now, why is ex nihilo creation important? It's important because if we think that God didn't create out of nothing, then we start asking ourselves, well, whatever God used then, where did it come from? Did somebody else make it? Or was it infinite and eternal like God? Here's the thing. Ex nihilo creation literally means out of nothing. Uh, you don't find it described in Genesis 1, 1 and 2, but there are many other scriptures that teach ex nihilo creation. For example, Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. This verse is telling us that there was a time when there was nothing but God, and God formed everything that there was, including that watery, formless, chaotic expanse. God formed that too. Uh, to me, even more clear is John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word. It's talking about Jesus. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Here you go. All things came into being through Him. That is ex nihilo creation. That is out of nothing creation. All things came into being through Him. And without Him, not one thing came into being. That is God's creation. God is the God who brings order to chaos and we are made in God's image. That's why that crooked light bothers us. That's why we want to straighten a picture. That's why when we see something on the floor, we want to pick it up. That's why when things happen in our lives we don't understand, we worry with it until we can make sense of it. Because we are created in the image of God. Genesis 1.27, in the image of God, God created mankind. We're created in God's image. And God is a God who brings order to chaos. Now, I think about, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about another time in the Bible where it talked about God's Spirit blowing through. Can you think of what time I, I, I thought of? I thought of Pentecost. Right? Let's see if I've got something here. Yeah. Now, let's look at the story of Pentecost just real quick. Acts chapter 2. This was after Jesus had died, was buried, rose again, ascended into heaven. He told the apostles to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Spirit. So here we have it described. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost, Pentecost was a Jewish festival. That's how they marked out time. So when the, it, it, for us, it's a, it's a celebration in the Christian church. We think of the birthday of the church, and we wear red, and we think about the Spirit coming. When Luke wrote this, when the day of Pentecost, he wasn't talking about, oh yeah, that day when the Spirit came. He was talking about the Jewish festival. Okay. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together, all the disciples, apostles, in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, 
and a tongue rested on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, uh, at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each, amazed and astonished. They said, are not all these who speak in Galileans? How is it that we hear each of each of us in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene. I wonder if they said all this. And the visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. In Genesis 1, we have God's Spirit blowing in and bringing order to chaos and bringing creation. In Acts chapter 2, we have another instance of God's Spirit blowing in, but it seems from what we read here, that seems like chaos to me. What do you mean God is the God who brings order and chaos? It seems to me the Holy Spirit brought craziness, chaos. What's going on there? Well, Peter explains it. Verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem. Peter didn't go through that whole list of all those people. That's a good thing. Uh, who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs in the earth below, blood, fire, and smoky mist. Then the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood and the, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter explains what's going on by saying two things are happening. God's Spirit is working to bring the day of the Lord and God is working to save people. The day of the Lord is a it, in the Bible, it's a time of decisive visitation of, of, of God, of Yahweh when he intervenes to deliver and exalt the faithful remnant who worship him and establish his own rule. You think about that. Establish his own rule. Immediately I'm thinking of Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, when Peter explains what's happening at Pentecost, he says, this in, incoming of the Spirit of God is not bringing chaos. It's bringing order. It's bringing a new order. It's bringing the day of the Lord. It's bringing God's salvation. It's bringing thy kingdom come, thy will be done. God ordered the world in Genesis 1. And in Acts chapter 2, we see God furthering his work to reorder the world, to redeem the world, to reconcile the world, to restore the world. And God intends to do it through his church. See, God's spirit has come to the church and God's Spirit is working through the church to bring the day of the Lord. And when you hear that, you can read, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And to bring salvation to people. This is the way that God is bringing order, renewal, and reorder to the world. And we are invited to be part of this. Now think, Genesis, we're created in God's image. God has given us his spirit to make us part of this co-creation, this renewal, this reordering of the world. God's given us that work. There's a paraphrase 
of the Lord's Prayer that I like. And part of it says, uh, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven through us. We volunteer. A couple of things to think about. God's Spirit was bringing order, a new order. We're invited to be part of that work. Two questions to think about as we finish up this part. What am I doing now to be a co-creator with God's Spirit to create God's new world? How am I being a part of God's restoring, renewing work? What am I doing to be part of that? God's called His church to be part of that. What am I doing? Second question to think about is, what can I do? What are things, opportunities maybe that I have that I haven't taken advantage of? What are resources that I have that, that I could put into play here in, in helping make God's new, restored, renewed world? What can I do to be a co-creator with God's Spirit to create God's new world? God renews, God restores, God brings order out of chaos. God wants to do that to our broken world, our chaotic world. God wants to do that today, and God's going to work through his church. Will we be part of that? That's the question. We're going to sing a song now. This song is called uh, Sing His Love. Uh, and, you know, this song looks ahead to the final day of the Lord when we when the, says the world will sing His love. But now, as we're trying to work toward that, maybe as a church, we can say as the people of God, we are going to sing God's love. We're going to spread God's love. We're going to show God's love. We're going to work with God's love. To redeem, to restore, to reorder this world for thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Let's stand together as we sing.
affirm our faith together. I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, Creator and Heaven. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, the Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Father's power, was so crucified, died, and was buried there. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, existing across time and distance, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. It's time for our prayer time. As we come to our our prayer time, Sherry, I'll do this part here because I've got some uh, some things to add in. When we come to our prayer time, I want you to kind of meditate and ask God, listen to God, think with God this morning. What can I do? to be a co-creator with God. The first thing I want you to think about is with my neighbors. Lord, how could I bring more of your restored creation, how you want things to be, thy kingdom come. How could I make that more real with my neighbors? What could I do, Lord? In my relationships, God show me. How can I make my relationships reflect more how God wants things to be in my relationships? Work relationships, family relationships, friendships, social relationships. What could you do to be a co-creator with God in your relationships? Maybe the Spirit will bring something to your mind and it will kind of stand out to you. Boy, when I see that, I, the word that God brings to my mind is listen. Just listen. What can I do to be a co-creator with God in my church. Lord, what's your plan for me? Lord, how can I contribute? Lord, what should I do? How can I be a co-creator of God's renewed and restored world in my church? I mean, be a part of something that's going on, start something new. Uh, how could I? In the world. What can I do to be a co-creator with God in the world? There are so many needs in our world. Which ones touch your heart the most? And lastly. What can I do to be a co-creator with God in my own soul? God wants to draw us closer to God's self. What can we do to work, cooperate with God in our own souls growing closer to God? What could I do? Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. It's time for communion, and we will begin. God's presence is with us. The Spirit is among us and in us. Let us center our attention on God. We open our lives to receive God's grace. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and our praise. And we're going to do that this morning in song. We're going to sing a song called Hallelujah, which means praise God. And it's based on Psalm 148. We'll sing that together.
Okay. The scriptures tell us that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Eat this and remember me. And after the dinner, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this and remember me. Let's pray together. Lord, pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be your body working with you to create a world that reflects your kingdom. We pray this in your name. Amen. The bread we break is the bread of life. The cup we share is the cup of salvation. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So if you are using one of the single serve communion cups, you simply peel back, top layer, eat the wafer, body of Christ. Peel back the second layer, drink the juice, the blood of Christ shed for you. Uh, in a few moments, our, our, when you're invited to come up, you just come down the center aisle. You'll go to either side. There'll be two stations. You'll receive a small piece of bread, eat that. Small cup of juice, drink that, then return by the side aisles. So if I could have my servers come up, please. You're invited to come to the Lord's table.
up. Let's just come on down. You know, obviously one way that we work with God is when we get to support God's work, the work that God is doing. All right, so you two work together. You two work together. Work with Simone. There we go. All right. All right, well, I'll tell you what, Simone, I'll give you a idea. All right, let's pray together. God, we thank you for the fact that you allow us to be part of your work. God, may we never take that for granted. And God, uh, may we ask ourselves, Lord, how can we use what we have to accomplish your work in this world? And God, we pray you put your blessing on this offering today. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. So Let's stand together, please. Just two things 
I want to mention, uh, there is on the table out in the entryway a, uh, a paper like this. In fact, there are two of them. There's one from, for this week and then one for next week. Each week there's a little sheet like this. It's a, it's a take-home Bible self-study for the next week's text. So in other words, there's one out there for Genesis 1 which we preached this morning. You can take that home and look through it, study through it if you'd want to. And then this one is for Acts chapter 8, which will be our text for next Sunday. So take it home, read through the text. There's some questions to think about. There's maps on the back of where these things happen that the story tells us about. So take, take one of these with you and work on it at home during the week and kind of, you know, get yourself ready for, for next Sunday. Uh, then one other thing, next Sunday is June birthdays. All right, I'm excited about that. Uh, I, well, there are a lot. Oh, there are a lot. There are a few June birthdays, right? Okay. All right. Judy turned to 29 again this year, and so thank you, Judy. But we'll talk about that next Sunday. And uh, next Sunday, I, if everything comes together the way it should, uh, we may have something, uh, a little extra time in our fellowship time for birthdays after worship, but I'll let you know about that next Sunday. You come at the regular time, and we'll make sure you know what's going on. So, but that'll be for next Sunday. There's always cake on birthday Sunday, which that's the one time that you can just, you know, that's your your cheap meal. You know, yeah, okay, I'm going to have cake. It's once a month, I can have cake at church once a month. And so there you go. So that'll be next Sunday. And I hope you're here for that. Uh, a lot of folks will be gone during the summer. So uh, it's important for all of us to do our part as people are, are taking time off in the summer. Now, Tuesday, no, Monday, Alice, when uh, things are getting delivered on Monday. Now, if people want to come help with that, what time it would be good? I'm sorry. Okay, so as a lot of you know, we do uh, once a month during the school year, we do a pancake breakfast right up here at Holloway School, and we do a distribution from the community food bank. During the summer when school's closed, we move it to our food pantry, which is in the back part of our campus. You park in this back parking lot. You see the sign, it's there. Uh, so the food bank is delivering uh, their normal shipment on Monday, between 8 and 10, so we need to get it set up, get it ready. And then Tuesday, our normal food pantry day, we open at 7 and go to 3. Uh, our normal food pantry day, then we'll have not only the things we usually have in the food pantry, but all the things from the community food bank. And uh, you know what? We'll, we'll get a lot of stuff on Monday, have a lot of stuff Tuesday. Uh, but just, uh, we help a lot of people through the food pantry. I mean, a lot of people. And, and I would say every week, most of the stuff that comes in goes out. So we can always use donations. You can bring them on Sunday morning. You can bring them on Tuesday and drop them off. Uh, on our website, the top, there's food pantry. You can just drop that down and, you know, how to help. And it's got the list of things that we can use right there. So if you want to uh, contribute toward that, uh, there's, there's your option. Uh, so that's what's going on. And so as we think about God creating, God's Spirit blowing on the water and creating, God's Spirit blowing through the room where the disciples were to create a new world, you and I have the privilege and the responsibility to be part of that new creation. You know, the mission statement of the United Methodist Church, making disciples just so we can have more disciples. That's not what it says. Making disciples for the transformation of the world. God's reordered, renewed, restored creation. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today.